I, I thought I would begin with talking about Gaza, you know, because uh, I was just sent this picture of the IDF flying a flag over Gaza. <laughs> So, you know, people are sending that around and celebrating it. And, uh, you know, there's tanks on the beaches in Gaza. And so people are celebrating these pictures. And I get it. On some level, I get it. But my heart just won't let me. It won't let me celebrate it because it just feels like we're not we're not getting it yet. It's not first of all, it's not enough. It's not enough. We want we so badly want to celebrate something, but the fact that there's anyone in Hamas that still has a pulse, that is still breathing, I can't celebrate until all of them are wiped off the map, until they don't exist anymore, and all of the captives have been brought back to the to the state of Israel, to the land of Israel. And so I, I can't celebrate that, but but also because I remember that we were in Gaza. I remember being in Gaza, and I'm not talking about in the army. I'm talking that there were there were thriving Jewish communities in Gaza before 2005. Do you remember that? It was called Gush Katif. Gush Katif. When Israel liberated the ancient Jewish communities of Gaza in 1967. You remember the 67 war, the Six Day War, the whole world you know, it was the, I, I was told, so I've told every time I meet someone who was like alive then, who was, uh, you know, I, I very often I'll say, what was it like? What was it like to be in America then? What was it like to be in Israel then? And I remember my dad saying that when he went to school that next day, there were some Italian kids that would beat him up. They didn't beat him up that next day. They certainly didn't. Jews were held in high esteem. And Jews, Jews that had nothing to do with that war, sitting in Valley Stream, New York, they were held in high esteem because of what happened in Israel, because whether we'd like it or not, every Jew in the world is a reflection or a manifestation of Israel, whether they like it or recognize it or not. And um, and so in 1967, that, that's what it was. And so Israel liberated these ancient Jewish communities and these brave Jews went down and started settling the land. And the Arabs in the region laughed at them and said that it would be impossible to really do anything in Gaza. It was empty, parched, desert sand dunes. Nothing was there. Uh, but what the Arabs didn't know was that the prophets of Israel foretold that when the Jews return to the desert, it will blossom like a Chabad Selet. Right? Isaiah chapter 35, verse 1. The arid desert shall be glad. The, the wilderness shall rejoice and shall blossom like a rose. It's actually not a rose, it's a Chavat Selet, but that is the translation that I've been getting. But anyways, um, it's been a, a lily. But anyways, and within just a number of years, the innovative pioneers of Gush Katif made an oasis, an oasis in the desert. Uh, hydroponics, all of these new technologies were developed to make these sand dunes not only blossom, but I remember reading the articles that nearly 60% of Israel's organic exports, organic tomatoes, were exported from Gush Katif. And then, for reasons that are way too long and way too depressing and way too corrupt to get into, Israel decided to unilaterally disengage from Gaza, doing actual ethnic cleansing. Israel is constantly accused of ethnic cleansing. Constantly. There's only one time Israel was actually guilty of ethnic cleansing, and that is when they forcefully transferred out every Jew from Gaza. And uh, I was a part of that. I saw that. They ripped us. Out. They even, I remember seeing with my eyes, they dug up the graves of the Jews that were murdered by the genocidal jihadists that they were giving Gaza to, because otherwise the, they would have dug up the graves and desecrated the bodies. And I remember going down to Gaza um, two weeks before because they barricaded it, not wanting Jews from throughout the land to go to Gaza to prevent them to cause trouble. So we went there two weeks ahead of time. And I went there with Yishai and Malka and a bunch of friends and the Adler family and and we went down there and um, we did everything that we could to fight this horrible disengagement. Because not only was it the injustice of it was 
was insane and psychotic, but because it would obviously, obviously, obviously lead to exactly this scenario. So here's the, you know, the tail end of the video. If you want to see the whole video of the soldiers taking me out of Gaza, you can go and see it on YouTube. But this is, this is the end of the soldiers carrying me out of Gaza. <laughs> אדוני, אני מבקש ממך בוא איתנו ברגל, פעם אחרונה. בוא נרד. בוא. נרד, תבוא איתנו ברגל האוטובוס. בוא. Now, the, the soldiers begged me to walk out with them voluntarily, but I refused. I would not voluntarily walk out of the land of Israel and surrender it for delusional nothingness to genocidal jihadi terrorists. It was important for me, for my own soul, not to voluntarily just get up and walk out. And I think it was important for them to feel the pain of what they were doing. And, uh, and it was difficult for me because, like, they're my brothers and I love them. And I love them even at that moment. There was never any anger. Mm, there was anger. There was never any hatred. There was never any hatred to them. And, um, and many of them, by the way, did feel pain and suffered tremendous PTSD from what they were ordered to do to their brethren and to their land. And it was very difficult for me to be standing so vehemently against my fellow IDF soldiers. Because you have to understand that I was raised in Houston, Texas. And the word Sahal, Sava Haganali Israel, you know, the, the Israel Defense Forces was holy. The uniform of the Israeli army was holy. I remember my father coming to my uh, ceremony of getting my beret and he was just weeping, seeing his son wear this holy sanctified garment. And to stand against my fellow soldiers that way broke something inside of me. And in, in retrospect, I see that what it broke was the idol of the Israeli army that was in my own heart. Because I remember that before the disengagement, I was on a personal campaign, on a mission to advocate to my fellow soldiers to refuse orders. And even on the right wing, okay, this was like very controversial. This was very extreme. But to me, I, like when I see something that is just true in my heart, I don't know if it's objectively true, but if I have to follow that inner voice in my heart. And to me, that voice was not only that I should refuse orders, but that I should encourage others to refuse orders as well. Because there, there were those who were so uncomfortable with the thought of being ordered to ethnically cleanse their fellow Jews from the land of, of Israel, that they told their commanders that they couldn't bring themselves to do it. And many of them were just allowed to sit it out and to stay on base. They were allowed to do that. The army didn't want problems. And in my opinion, I was advocating very loudly that that was not enough. Because while their own personal conscience would be clean, they were still guilty. By not speaking up, by not fighting it, they were complicit. And I was telling them that they should go down to Gaza as ordered. And only at the very last moment, they should refuse orders in the loudest way possible and inspire their fellow soldiers to do the same. And there were those that did that. I remember there was a kid named Bieber that did that. His last name was Bieber. I forgot his first name. Um, and, uh, you know, he was put in jail, but he was released and whatever. Jail is not a big deal. In, uh, to me, it's, it's not that big a deal, like especially army jail. It's not that different than the, than the army itself. And, um, and so there are those that did, but clearly not enough to change what we know happened. And I remember speaking to some of the residents that were on the verge of having their farms destroyed and their home, homes turned over to the very jihadi terrorists that had been murderizing, murdering them and that had been um, terrorizing them for years. And it was so long ago, but I remember a conversation with someone who said that they, they told their own children not to refuse orders. They live there, right? And they weren't come, They just couldn't bring themselves to do it because, like I said, to them, it was the same to me. The IDF is the reason we're in the land of Israel. Without the IDF, if we refuse orders, then the fabric of the army falls apart and the IDF is sacrosanct. And, and that's when I remember feeling like there's an element of idolatry that had been infused in our relationship with the idea, uh, IDF itself. And that doesn't mean the IDF is bad. God forbid. You know, but when you have an idol, which we all have, or idolatry is infused into some relationship that you have, even if it's a healthy and a good relationship. I know I have idols even now. I know that I do. 
because I still have waves of fear that come over me. Um, but um, but it's important to recognize it and to seek them and to seek to what are the illusions and help break them because otherwise they will be broken over our own head because when you have an idol, it is very often that very idol that is used to break itself over your head. And it was that very sacred Israeli army that uprooted them from their home. The army is not Hashem. The army is not God. The army is a vehicle that Hashem has used and I truly believe will use to sanctify his great name. But it doesn't mean that everything that the Israeli army does is perfect and good and right because it's a vessel and it's a vehicle and it could be used for, for bad also. And, and it was a disaster. It was a desecration of God's name. And I remember finding with all of my heart not to hate my fellow Jews that I felt were so blind and so arrogant and so callous, you know, sitting in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv, uh, what I felt like was virtue signaling saying, oh, yeah, we're going get, to get, get out of Gaza. It's not their families and their farms and their homes that were being uprooted and destroyed and given to the terrorists that had been picking them off one by one, sometimes entire families for years. You know, so that was hard for me. That was a big challenge. And uh, to see that this this beautiful, beautiful desert oasis of life and fertility that had been transformed from desert, empty, desolate dunes, just being given over to these terrorists who, by the way, you know, they tried to capitalize on on uh, the all of the exports and the vegetables. But for some reason, it was almost like the land itself just wasn't having it and they couldn't keep the worms out of it. everything fell apart on them. I, I still I still remember even now I remember seeing this very petition, this petition. It says here, Hit not kut ma'aza, tovala bitachon. The uh, disengagement from Gaza is good for security. And these were Bechirim, officers, high-ranking officers, who signed this petition that getting out of Gaza would be good for security. And then, of course, when I'm on CNN or something, Cristiano Montpour says, well, 111 high-ranking officers said it's this appeal to authority thing, as opposed to actually arguing on the, the merits of it. Um, and so, you know, they just knew, they knew it was just so smart to transfer the Jewish people out of Gaza and to surrender it to genocidal Nazi jihadists. And, you know, sometimes as a, as a people, I was telling this to, to Jeremy today, I think that the greatest miracle is that we as a people exist, because if it was left up to us, we, we don't even have like the basic survival instinct to fight for our own survival. And sometimes I think that we as a people can be so smart that we travel the entire circuit and end up being the dumbest people on the planet. I remember that there was a time, I must have been 15, that I was trying to shoot a bottle with a BB gun right behind me. And I was holding up the, uh, a mirror and I was looking at this BB gun and I was trying to aim it, right? And I was looking in the mirror and literally... As I was about to pull the trigger, my friend Daniel Ismi, he said, Ari, you know, the gun is pointed right at your eye. And I was like, oh, I was literally about to shoot myself in the eyeball with a BB gun. That is what the disengagement felt like. All of these, the pragmatism, you know, because we're operating in a ecosystem where the hatred against us is so overwhelmingly irrational and Nazi-like that if we try to react and deal with this psychotically irrational ecosystem in a rational way we end up just about to point that gun right in our own eye that's what the disengagement felt we were so careful at, at considering the geopolitical consequences of this insanity that we're facing that we neglected to realize that we we're about to blow our eyeball out of our head and possibly kill ourselves and i remember everyone was saying you know if we leave now if we leave gaza now the whole world will see it and if they shoot missiles at us from there, oh, then we're going to have the right to, to defend ourselves. Then we'll really lace into them. Then the world will definitely understand and the world will definitely be on our side. And, you know, it's just the same thinking again and again and again. And it's just so painful to see constantly thinking that the world are fair and honest arbiters, believing that there's anything that we can do to make the world see the obvious truth that that justice and goodness of Israel is so starkly contrasted with the forces of darkness and evil that we're against. How can the world not see that? You know, that's why I can't listen to people saying, we have these family WhatsApp group and some of my family's like, oh, Israel, we're just so bad at Hasbara, you know, at um, 
how do you say Hasbara in English, at defending ourselves in world media and making our case to the world. That's where we're lacking. We need to invest more money in that. And I just, I can't hear it anymore. Every war, everything, every all the time, it's the same thing. We need to have better Hasbara. We need to make a better case to the world. When we really make our case, then the world will be on our side and understand we're just not explaining ourselves well enough. You know, it's just like the only Hasbara we need is Hasbara that is not said in words, but in action. In responding to the Holocaust that we just endure, endured with righteous indignation and fury and relentless rage to put the fear of God into everyone that watched the gory, horrific details of rape and murder and they're salivating for more. Because they are. They are salivating for more. Why else would the world erupt in massive pro-Hamas rallies immediately after this Holocaust? The whole world is saying, gas the Jew. It's like... The, the 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 appetite has has started. The the uh, saliva is flowing. Uh, I don't understand why where this is coming from, but there's a spirit that is coming upon so much of the world, and um, you know, it's not hopelessness that motivates these jihadists. I know that all these Israeli leftist Jews. I've always had this thing like they're so hopeless. That's why they're throwing stones at our cars at our children. That's why they're slaughtering families because they're hopeless that. They don't have their own state and they want their own state. Another Muslim. That's what it is. That, that is what's causing this. Gen it's so delusional. It's not hopelessness. It's hope. Hope that they can murder every single Jew and wipe Israel off the map. The masks are coming off. And why? Because they want to be able to be evil. And they don't want this nation, this goody, goody nation that goes to offer assistance to Iran and Turkey who call for our genocide when they have an earthquake. We're there with humanitarian. They don't want that stuff. It's weakness. And it's a testimony to something that they don't want to be a part of. That's what I think it is. But the masks are coming off. And now at least, at least we know what we're facing. Because I don't know if you've been seeing the, you know, insane and shameful spectacle. Uh, we've been talking about it already of what's happening among the nations of the world and the Gentiles of the world. But the shameful spectacle of so much of the college age American Jews that are doing their, their sit-ins. Um, th this isn't only a, a product of, you know, America surrendering its universities to leftists decades ago and letting them wholesale brainwash the next generation, but it also comes from a very deep-rooted fear in the hearts of these students uh, that the hatred that they see towards their fellow Jews is in store for them as well. Maybe it's deep and subconscious and they don't recognize it. And they don't have the courage, they definitely don't have the courage of their character to stand up for it. So they delusionally believe that if they take the sides of their enemies against themselves, that they would be spared. You know, a, a student of history would know that, you know, just look back recently, recently in the scope of Jewish history, the Association of German National Jews. That was the name of the German Jewish organization during the early years of Nazi Germany that eventually came out in support of Adolf Hitler in support of Adolf Hitler. According to Wikipedia, this was the definition. The goal of the association of the was the total assimilation of Jews into German Volksgemeinschaft, meaning like the German society. Self-eradication of Jewish identity and the expulsion from Germany of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. Nauman, a man named Moses Nauman, I believe his name is Moses Nauman, his founder, was especially opposed to Zionists and Eastern European Jews. He considered the former, meaning Zionists, a threat to Jewish integration and carriers of a racist ideology serving British imperial purposes. He saw the, the latter as racially and spiritually inferior. Okay, like the Jews of America that routinely vote against Israel, that are marching against Israel now with Hamas. It, that, that's what it comes from. Here's what Max Nauman, the founder uh, of this association of, of German Jewish immigrants. This is what he said. He said, we have always held the well-being of the German people and the fatherland, to which we feel inextricably linked above our own well-being. Thus, we greeted the results of January 1933, even though it has brought uh, hardship for us personally. Those, those Jews ended up in the same concentration camps, in the same gas chambers as every other Jew. You know, a weak Israel 
makes every Jew in the world feel weak. It makes every Jew in the world feel vulnerable. A weak Israel emboldens the powers of evil in the world. Okay, this is the these this organization called If Not Now of these Jews from these campuses across America that went in and did a sit-in in the Congress, and they're sitting there on the floor in Congress reading the names of these supposed Gazan uh, Hamas Nikim. And I say Hamas because I don't want to say innocent civilians in Gaza, because they're not. You know, they're not innocent civilians. They're simply not there. I mean, I'm just thinking about um, Yishai was telling me and I saw I heard the, the the audio recording of a phone call of one of these Hamas Nikim calling his mother from the home of one of the families that he killed. He's like, my hands are drenched in blood. I've killed 10. I just needed to call you to share with you. The, the father's like, I'm so proud. The mother's like, oh, kill more, kill more. This is the mothers. This is the civilians. This is who they are. And those are the names they're reading, not the Jewish babies that have been decapitated and the mothers and the fathers and the children that have been burned. They're reading the names of supposed civilians. The reason I say so is because I'm sure I'm sure that there are those people in Gaza that have died. Of course there are. That's what happens when you put your headquarters under a hospital and under a school and try to maximize civilian casualties, whatever civilian means. So, that, of course, but I don't trust the Hamas medical examiners, whatever. You know, but they do. They do. And they're reading those names on the floor in Congress. And it's really it's not only it's because it's coming from a deep place of fear. I don't hate them. I'm not angry at them. I feel bad for them because not only they're obviously mentally unwell, but they are exactly that Jew that is so riddled with self-hatred and fear that they're sitting there on the side of Hamas. OK, sorry, guys, I'm getting a little bit. uh wrapped up here but but the point is that a weak israel makes every jew in the world weak and and every god-fearing bible believing person in the world is weakened when there's a weak israel and and it makes everybody feel vulnerable and it emboldens the powers of evil in the world i want you to see this interview by um the the head of hamas i don't even want to say his name may be erased from the world but this is an interview of him for on al jazeera لا شك أن دخول حزب الله يحدث فارقا حقيقيا ونحن نتمنى أن تحصل هذه الخطوة لكن هم أصحاب القرار هم منذ بداية هذا العدوان الصهيوني وهذه الحرب حرب الإبادة يشاغلون العدو في جبهة الشمال الفلسطيني ويشتبكون معه وهناك يعني معارك تسخن وتصعد باستمرار لكن لم تتطور بعد إلى دخول واسع وحرب مفتوحة تشتت تركيز العدو وتجعله يتحرك على جبهتين أو أكثر نحن ما زلنا نطالب الأمة نطالب حزب الله ونطالب أصدقانا وأمتنا ونريد حراك في الجاليات الغربية والعربية العربية في الغرب وتنسيق مع قوة كبرى بحجم الصين وروسيا لمعلوماتك روسيا استفادت مما لا نصرفنا الأمريكان عنهم وعن أوكرانيا الصين كذلك رأوا نموذج مبهر الروس قالون ما جرى في 7 أكتوبر سيدرس في العلم العسكرية الصينيون يفكرون بخطوة كيف يفعلون مع تايوان ما فعلته كتائب القسام 7 أكتوبر العرب يقدمون دروس للعالم You know, there, there's some sort of thing. Jews are such projectors. We project our values on the world and we insist unreasonably that the world is like us. So when, when I say we should go in and if, if they have their, their base, their headquarters of Hamas under the hospital, we should send a bunker buster under that hospital. That's exactly what we should do in all of the innocents. If there are any innocents there, it's on Hamas. And I say that and Jews are like, what would the world say? That would be so immoral. They would attack us. Did you hear what he was saying? The world doesn't care about morality. They care about strength, period. Countries don't have friends. They have interests. And so if we have a moral, strong, God-fearing country that's strong, then that will bring godliness into the world. And if we're weak or perceived as weak, then all of a sudden China's like, oh, we could do what Hamas did. We could do that to Taiwan. And Russia's going to go with Iran. And the axis is forming. And we see it happening. And the world is becoming bold in their evil. And the masks are coming off.
and they look at Jerusalem and they salivate like a like a wolf staring at a flock of sheep. But the great fatal mistake that they're making is that they have yet to encounter the shepherd of that flock, the shepherd of the flock of Israel, who will absolutely pour out his wrath upon them and humble them like they've never been humbled before. And that is what's going to happen. Do not worry. Do not worry. Do not be afraid. Be strong and be resolute. Because while it's painful to see this terrible desecration of God's name that we're seeing right now, and we have to fight against it with everything that we have, we have to fight to sanctify God's name. This is all part of his plan. Because the darkness will very soon turn to light, and the desecration will turn into the greatest sanctification that we've ever seen. That's my belief. That's where I'm holding. That is just, I, I can't shake it. I can't shake it. I know that I said I'm not doing the Mashiach is coming soon thing. But that was before this war. I believe that we are absolutely not only on the verge, on the precipice, but we're already in it. It's already happening. It's already unfolding. And, uh, and so I want to just read a little bit from the 51st chapter of the book of Isaiah. I wanted to read the whole chapter, but Jeremy just came back and we want to take questions and engage with you and hear what you have to say. So uh, so, uh, so I'm just going to read to you just the, the very end here. You afflicted and drunk, but not with wine. Thus says Hashem, and Hash, uh, Hashem, the, God, the Lord of hosts, who pleads the, he pleads the cause of his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, the dregs of the cup of my fury. You shall no longer drink of it but I will put it into the hand of those who have afflicted you, who have said to you, lie down that we may walk over you. And you've laid your body like the ground and as the street, those who walk over you right now, right? Even the bravest of us have moments of fear. It's part of what we need to be going through now. The cup of fear is still in our hands. Okay, we can try our best to navigate and channel that fear to fear of Hashem, but the world is big and the world is very convincing. And the world is very real. And so the 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 cup of fear is in our hand, but Hashem is about to take that out and put it in the hands of our enemies. And we are going to see it with our own eyes.